This episode of Live WP TV is sponsored by the Microsoft Nerd Center in Cambridge and HostGator.com. Hey everybody, I'm here to talk to you a little bit about language and why searching in WordPress kind of sucks. Um, so this is a presentation I gave about two days ago at WordCamp Providence. Um, I think I've changed all the search in place Providence with Boston here, but we'll see as I go through it. Anyway, first a uh, little bit about myself. My name is Xiao Yu. Uh, I can be found on Twitter as Hypertext Ranch, XYU on GitHub, and also I'm a code wrangler for Automatic. At Automatic, I'm one of the developers behind Jetpack related posts. And you may have seen this around the web. It looks something like this, or maybe like this, with images turned on. So at this point, uh, if you've ever been in the plugin repository, you may be saying to yourself, really, another related post plugin? This was a screenshot I took uh, about last week. And while there's not like a million related post plugins, there's definitely a lot. There's over 183 that mention explicitly related posts. And not only that, there's even one that says yet another related post as the plugin name. So first question is, what do we even name it? Can we name it like another, yet another related post plugin? <laughs> um, but in all seriousness, uh, why are there so many of these? Well, there's a lot because finding related content is a really, really hard problem to solve. And it's an even harder to problem to solve when you want to make it performant. So why is that? Well, it's because it's really two problems in one. It's a natural language processing problem and it's a search, search ranking problem. So first is the natural language processing part. So you have a piece of content. What you need to do is now extract out the keywords from that content. Once you have that extracted, extracted keywords, then you need to actually use that and search through every other post that you have and rank it based on how well it matches. So what does this look like in practice? So say I have a blog post and I want to find related posts for it. So the first step is pretty easy. I can just strip away everything and just have the content. But now what do we do with this? It's just a big old wall of text, right? We need to figure out what's important and what's relevant in this wall of text in order to actually find other related materials. Well, in language processing, there's this assumption that words that appear a lot across many things mean very little, and words that appear in a few posts are convey a lot more meaning. So here, for example, the word the, it probably appears in every single one of my posts, so it means nothing. The word HHVM probably appears in this and maybe one or two other posts. So that gives us a lot more contextual information about this blog post. So what does this mean? Well, I guess we could do something like this with my SQL, right? Just select count star from WP posts where post content like word and do this for every single word. <laughs> now we can know heuristically how many words are important, where they are and how important they are. But are we actually going to do this for a 500 word post? A thousand word post? Not if we want a database server that's not just a smoldering pile of ash, right? <laughs> so my SQL is not very good at natural language processing. But let's take a look at the search ranking side of things. So back to our wall of text. Say we had some magical WP extract important words function and we get all the important words from a post. What are we gonna do with these words? Well, first we need to find posts that contain them, right? Pretty simple. Um, select all from WP posts where post content like all the five words that we know are important. But now the problem comes, how do we sort the results? Right? A post that I have on HHVM benchmarking likely very important to this post my Improv Boston performance, not really relevant at all. But they're both going to appear because the words appear in it. 
So my SQL's not very good at search ranking either, as it turns out. And it's around this point that most developers that write related post plugins just give up and say, what the heck? Let's just use tags and categories. <laughs> because everyone tags and categorizes everything perfectly. Yeah, I see all you shaking your head. This doesn't happen, right? And even if you're the only author on your blog and you tag and categorize everything every single time, ask yourself, if you publish a new post, are you going to go back to every post you've written in the past year, past five years, and re-tag it if it's related? No, this doesn't work. Um, so hopefully at this point, I've convinced you that this is a super hard problem to solve, right? And it's a hard problem because we're limited by our tools, namely MySQL. But there's a new technology that's been developing in the past two or three years. It's called Elasticsearch that promises to solve a lot of these problems. So Elasticsearch on their website says they're a flexible, powerful, open source, distributed, real-time search and analytics engine. Man. It's a lot of buzzwords, but basically what they're saying is they're a fancy data store that's optimized for text analytics and text ranking, which sounds perfect, right? It sounds like exactly what we need. But then you think, well, if we run this with WordPress, that means we're going to have to have two data stores, right? Elasticsearch and MySQL which means now there's more complexity. We need to keep these two data stores both in sync. There's more points of failure. There's more cost. And cost not just in more servers that we have to run, but the mental cost of keeping two very different systems up and running. So the question is, is it really worth it for some better search results? Right. Well, to answer that question, I want to take a quick little detour and ask, why are we all here, right? We all just came back from work, from a long day. Now we're sitting and talking about a guy, or listening to a guy give a random talk about a new technology. Not exactly what everyone would like to do at the end of the day. But we're here because we love WordPress, right? And we love WordPress not because it's the newest or hippest thing, not because everyone else is using it, and certainly not because a client wanted a site developed on it done yesterday. <laughs> we love it because it's open and inclusive, which is to say it allows us to tinker with themes and with plugins, and it's inclusive in that it allows us to run it almost anywhere. It's pretty hard these days to find a web host that can't run WordPress, in fact. But more importantly, this openness and inclusiveness is an extension of the WordPress culture itself, of our love of expressing ourselves with written language, be it it's this, or this, or even this. Right? Written language, this is a uniquely human trait that we all share. And this is humanity's best and longest lasting invention. And it's this richness that's captured by WordPress installs all over the world. Unfortunately, much of this richness is locked away because MySQL understands strings. So what do I mean by that? Well, say I have another blog post that goes something like this. I almost ran into a swarm of baby ducks this morning on the Charles. So here's what MySQL sees, just a string of bytes which, you know, is perfectly fine. It stores a string of bytes and it retrieves it every time someone wants to look at that blog post. What happens when someone comes to my blog and wants to find out what I've written about ducks? Well, this is a solved problem, right? We do select all from WP posts where post content like ducks. So what happens when uh, you execute this query on MySQL? Well, what happens is it first turns that ducks into this, the bytecode for ducks. And then it takes this bytecode and looks at every single piece of post content in every single post for this string of bytes, one by one by one 
until it finds it and returns that post. So this works. As you can imagine, it's a little bit slow because it has to look through everything, but it finds things, right? Until it doesn't. What happens if someone says, I want to know what Sal has written about running? Well, unfortunately, the bytecode for running is nowhere in ran. So we English speakers know that semantically, the meaning of these two words are the same. But to my sequel, they're not identical, so it's not going to come up. Luckily, Elasticsearch can understand language. And it can understand language and unlock the richness that's embedded within our blog posts. And it does this through these things called analyzer chains. So what are analyzer chains? Well, they consist of three parts in Elasticsearch. So as input, it takes some raw text, your blog post. It runs it through a set of character filters to clean up that text. It then runs it through a tokenizer to chop that up into words. Once it has a stream of words, or a set of words, it runs them through a set of token filters. And after it's done filtering and manipulating those set of words and tokens, you end up with what are called terms. And these terms are basically the semantic meanings behind that piece of raw text. So let's take a look at how this works in practice. So here's another sentence that I want to analyze. Right? Pretty simple. We all type this over and over at some point in our lives, probably. Um, this is what it looks like in HTML, right? Pretty straightforward. You got a paragraph tag. You got some HTML uh, entity encoded characters. This is what gets stored by MySQL, and this is what gets passed to Elasticsearch. And we can immediately see there's some stuff that we don't really want to index. A paragraph tag, HTML tags, they don't provide meaning to your blog post, right? HTML entity encoded uh, characters, you don't, no one's going to search for you umle, for uh, umla to you, right? So we pass it through a character filter. It filters out the HTML tags. It cleans up the encoded characters. So now it looks like a regular sentence. So now we can move on to the next step, tokenizing it. So because this is English, tokenization is pretty simple. We tokenize based on white space or punctuation marks. right? That's how we separate words. For other languages, this is a little more complicated. For example, Chinese, Japanese, Korean. But there are specialized tokenizers for that, so you don't actually even have to worry about that. You just have to say, this is a piece of Korean text. And some guy with a PhD has already figured out how to tokenize that for you. <laughs> but here, simple. We chop it up based on punctuation and white space. I'm just going to reorder this a little bit. We now have 10 words. Pretty simple. We now call this our token stream. What happens now is you can configure any set of token filters that operate on this token stream. So let's take a look at the first example. First, I'm going to run something called a lowercase token filter on it. So what this does is it takes every single token, and if there's an uppercase letter, it emits the exact same token or word except all in lowercase. So here, the got lowercase. Everything else is already lowercase, so everything else stays the same. And these token filters are chained one after another. So now we can run the next token filter on this token stream. Next, let's take a look at that umlaute u. So here, I type uber with the umlaut, but not everyone types Uber with the umlaut, right? And we don't want to disadvantage those people that don't type it properly. So what character folding does is it takes higher level ASCII characters and folds it down to the regular ASCII character set. So this umlaut u just becomes a regular u. So if we do this for all our text, we normalize it so that people typing different things but mean the same thing get 
normalized into the same tokens. Uh, next, we can look at something a little more advanced. Uh, we have this thing in linguistics called stemmers. So stemmers are, they appear a lot more in uh, other languages like Spanish, where you have things like masculine and feminine endings, but it also appears in English, where we pluralize things with S, right? So dogs and dog, they're the same thing. So what we can do is we can just chop off that S to normalize it. And because we can customize tokenizers per language, we can even add in dictionary lists so it's smart enough to turn geese into goose. Next, let's look at this thing called stop words. So stop words in linguistics are words that appear so often that they appear in almost every single piece of text. And because they appear in every single piece of text, they offer almost no meaning to any piece of text. So to make our searching go faster, we can just go ahead and chop them entirely out, right? So our token filters can actually filter out and remove entire tokens if we want. On the flip side of that, uh, we can have synonym filters that inflate meaning. So if on my blog I know a bunch of scientists comes to it and they search based on genus names instead of common English animal names, I can put in a synonym filter that takes words like fox and dog and emit not only those words back, but also the genus for those animals to inflate the meaning of words that someone put in. So that's probably enough for now. You, as you can imagine, you can configure any number of these. But let's say that's our set of terms. Now that we have these terms, we can build what's called an inverted index, which is basically a fancy term for a dictionary list, right? You have terms on one side and the document IDs that those terms appear on in the other. So as you index more documents, you build up this list, not only in terms of number of words, but also in which documents each word appears in. Now the magic comes when we're actually querying for this data. So say we have someone coming in and they search for jumping foxes. So the magic happens when we actually run this query string through the exact same analyzer chain we use to index the data. If we do that, we also inflate and normalize the meaning of this query string into these three tokens. And now it's a simple matter of looking up those three tokens in our dictionary list and immediately, we not only know where and what documents they appear in, the frequency of those words across all documents, as well as the intersection of those documents and other words. And this lets us know the semantic ideas behind words that people are searching for and that people are writing about. And that's how Elasticsearch understands language via customized analyzers. And as you can imagine, these things are really powerful because you can customize it based on language or even target audience to really fine tune and extrapolate the actual semantic meanings behind what you're posting and what your audience are searching for. So that's the natural language processing side of things. Uh, what about search ranking? Well, let's talk a little bit about queries and query relevancy in Elasticsearch. In Elasticsearch, there's two types of query parameters. There's filters and then there's queries. Let's take a look at filters first. These are super, super fast and they're cached. And they work basically like MySQL. They give you a Boolean yes or no answer. Something either matches a filter or they don't match a filter. Next, we have queries. These execute a little slower. They are never cached in Elasticsearch, but they give you the, uh, this thing called a relevancy score in your result. So what is a relevancy score? In Elasticsearch, it uses this industry standard called TF-IDF. Um, you can configure other ones like the M25. However, they operate mostly on the same principle, so understand one, you understand the other. 
So what is this kind of complicated and white hairy thing that uh, is called TFIDF? Well, it stands for term frequency inverse document frequency. So let's break that up a little bit. First, term frequency. So this means how many times a term appears in a document. So logically, if you think about this, a word that appears in a post once is likely less important than a word that appears in a post 10 times. And all that fancy complicated math you see there, that's basically to adjust it for natural language so that we can say things like, you know, if a term appears five times in a post 500 words long, it's likely more important than the same term appearing five times in a post that's 10,000 words long. Pretty standard. Next, we have inverse document frequency. So this gets at how important a word is across your entire language base. So this is a count of how many documents a term appears in throughout your entire index. So does a word appear 10 times in your 10,000 post uh, site? Or does it appear 1,000 times in your 10,000 post site, right? So we know that a post that appears only 10 times is likely more important than one that appears 10,000 times because it's a more specific term. It offers more semantic meaning for this one post because it narrows down things so much more. And once again, the fancy bit of math there is to adjust for natural linguistic tendencies of having basically words that either appear in like, you know, 90% of your posts or words that appear only in like 2% because they're the actual meaningful words versus conversational words, let's say. So to get relevancy score, you basically multiply these two things together and you get a pretty good estimation as to how important this word is to your document and how important this word is throughout your entire blog or set of documents. But as you can imagine, doing these fancy calculations for every single word in every single document is a bit time consuming. So Elasticsearch best practices is to first filter to reduce the number of documents that could match and then query to figure out how well they match. But regardless of whether you filter or not filter or anything like that, what this relevancy score means is given a blog post like we had before, we can now know exactly how much semantic meaning each word contributes to this blog post, which means it's pretty simple to know which words are the most important in this blog post. And not only that, but we can turn around and take these words and see how much meaning they contribute to every single other post which means now we have not only natural language processing, but we have search ranking. We can let Elasticsearch do all the work for us, finding the important words and finding out what other posts those important words appear in and how well they correlate with the document we're looking at. And Elasticsearch can do this really, really, really fast too because it's a clustered database. It will take your one query and execute it on 5, 10, 20 different servers at once and then combine all that result together at the very end. So hopefully at this point I've convinced you Elasticsearch is pretty awesome and it's something that we really need in WordPress. But now you're thinking, wait a minute, I have WordPress. Do I really want to run a bunch of Elasticsearch servers? You probably don't. <coughs> Luckily, at Automatic, we do run a rather large Elasticsearch server, or rather Elasticsearch cluster with a set of servers. And we can let other WordPress users take advantage of it through Jetpack, namely related posts. So because of all the aforementioned awesomeness of Elasticsearch, Jetpack related posts works relatively well out of the box, analyzing your post and finding 
other intersecting posts. But um, it also includes a bunch of filters that you can actually use to customize to do filtering before we actually do the coding part. So you can kind of look at it, the code. I also gave a talk at WordCamp Main a couple months ago. Um, that's on WordPress TV, I believe, um, to really customize and fine tune the results that you get back. But wait, there's more. <laughs> there's also an API that comes with this. So as soon as you turn on related posts and you turn on the JSON API, and don't worry, we do have plans to move this to the WordPress standard JSON API at some point once that's out. But for now, this is the Jetpack JSON API. You can actually use this to query the Elasticsearch cluster directly to find related posts for yourself for whatever application that you want to run it with. So this is an example query. Um, it looks pretty long, but uh, it's somewhat self-explanatory. So right here, it's basically going to my site. It's looking at one post, post ID 2361, and it's finding related content for it. And then in the post data section, it has this thing called filter. And filter is basically a mirror of Elasticsearch filter parameters. So whatever Elasticsearch filter parameter you can run, you can pass directly to this Jetpack JSON API, and it will take it and apply it uh, before running your related post query on it. So here, um, this filter is basically two parts. It's saying both of these has to be true. It has to have a post format of image, gallery, or video, and it has to be within a geographic distance of 20 mi 25 miles from the center of Boston. So something like this would have been almost impossible to execute in MySQL. But a query like this returns, on average, uh, well, not average, the median response time is somewhere around 200 milliseconds with the 99th percentile under a second. So this is really, really powerful stuff that if you want to play around with, I definitely recommend. And if you do, definitely take a look at the developer docs on wordpress.com at developer.wordpress.com slash docs slash Elasticsearch. So here we document the 16 different filters that you can use, as well as the 100 different post fields that you can query against. And in these 100 post fields, there's you know your standard ones like post title, post content, post excerpt, and whatnot. But there's also a couple really specialized ones um, that get extracted from your post content. Things like short codes, images, or links. So you can do complicated queries like only find me related posts that contain a YouTube video. Or only get me results that have a featured image or two images in the post. So it's you can do some really, really fancy and complicated stuff with it. And we see a lot of our uh, WordPress.com VIP clients really enjoy playing around with Elasticsearch because of this. And you can also work with us, right? We're always hiring. If you really, really love Elasticsearch and really get into it, definitely apply. We're always looking for more people to work on Elasticsearch cluster. Uh, we have one of the largest in the world, aside from a three-letter agency that has way more metadata. Um, but for public content, where are the biggest? <laughs> and that's pretty much it for uh, my presentation. And I'd love to take your questions at this point. Uh, yes? Well, you've proven that you're very smart. Uh, my question is about Jetpack in total. Mm -hmm. um, because there's a lot of uh, a lot of comments on the web about jetpack breaking sites, slowing down sites, and other negative comments. So, is turning on jetpack turning on everything, or can you use this individually? No. So, once you install jetpack, there's something ridiculous like 30 different modules in there. 
Uh, by default, um, most of them are not turned on. So related post is one of them. It is not turned on by default. Uh, for every module in Jetpack, if you disable it, it basically does not load at all. It does consume some disk space on your server, but that's pretty much the only thing that happens. So with related posts, it's off by default. You turn it on and it's, we basically do an asynchronous index of your content in the background. Um, this, depending on how fast your server is, may take a couple hours or maybe it takes a week, depending on, because we actually still uh, slow down that process to not slow down your server too much. Um, Elastic search for the MSA originally? No, <laughs> I have not. <laughs> uh, yes? Uh, it seems to me, correct me if I'm wrong, but there's a presumption that the word, if it's mentioned less in the content, it must be important. And this whole thing is based on that presumption, or it's more than a presumption. It's Yes. It's solid science that it must be important if it's mentioned less. Uh, so there's two parts. A word, if mentioned more in a single piece of text, is likely to mean more. If a word appears in less throughout all text in the known universe, it's likely to mean more, right? Because it's likely to offer more contextual meaning behind it than a word that appears globally. So if I have a post about um, feeding my cat and a post about WordPress performance, if the same word appears in both posts, it, it, it likely has less semantic meaning, right? Because it carries some meaning in both. And because those two are not related, likely it's less targeted. Um, so there's... Yes. Compare it to an index of the every content on this planet and saying, oh, this word counts a million times over there. It must not be good. Uh, it's not comparing it, right? So. Like two milliseconds. It's, yes, so it's. it's at your block. Um, so, in determining the term frequency, which is how often it appears in the universe, let's just say, of content. Um, it depends on how much, how many documents you index into it, right? So if you run your own Elasticsearch cluster and you only index your blog, then it's only looking at every piece of content, every single word on your blog. For us at um, WordPress.com, it's looking at roughly, uh, let's see, 500,000 blogs um, when it's doing that. So it's a pretty good average sample of all terms. Um, but yes, it is actually looking at how many times each word appears in all 500,000 blogs at once. Uh, yes, back there. Oh, uh, so, so Jetpack is completely free. Uh, related posts in Jetpack is completely free. You can install it and start playing around with basically this API and queries and whatever you want immediately. Well, after it indexes your site, obviously, but after that, no cost whatsoever. Um, also, Elasticsearch itself is a completely free and open source product. Their business model is rather like WordPress in that there's Elasticsearch.org and Elasticsearch.com. You can pay up the wazoo for Elasticsearch.com or run your own Elasticsearch.org server. Um, there's also a bunch of companies that do hosted Elasticsearch, so 
For example, for us, uh, we don't allow arbitrary searching right now. We only allow you to do related content searching with Elasticsearch because we don't allow you to pass in a random query uh, into this API, right? The query is the actual post that you're trying to find related to. Um, we only allow you to pass in filter parameters. But if you do find that you want to run more complicated like query parameters, um, there's a company here in Boston called Qbox.io that does something like a $5 a month like hosted Elasticsearch thing where you just sign up and send content to. Yep. So for Jetpack related posts, it's free. It runs on automatic infrastructure. Uh, the best part about it is that in that you turn on related posts for other things, a lot of it kind of crashes your site because it's running so many queries. Here you're offloading all that to automatic. Uh, yes. And experiences, it's not uh, negatively affecting page load speeds. Uh, we, uh, so I've written, uh, or I, or slash, we have written uh, Jetpack related posts to load always asynchronously. So when you load your page, it never actually loads related content for it. Once the DOM has rendered, it will fire off Ajax request for related content and then populate it in the page. Um, so things like recently published posts, right? If when you first publish a post, it has to get synced over to automatic, we then have to index it, and then we give you the related <coughs> content. So that may take upwards of two to three seconds before that completes. In that case, we don't want the pe people to be waiting for a page load, right? So you might get a case where if your post is basically just like one sentence, it might end up not loading related content on the first try, or it might load like, you know, 10 seconds in or something weird like that, but it never slows down your initial page load. Uh, yes. Uh, sorry? Um, so Elasticsearch uh, is a entirely RESTful interface um, in that it basically looks like this when interacting with it. You use HTTP requests for it. So if you've done any JavaScript, Ajaxy type stuff, um, you can jump in and like kind of understand what's going on. Um, and because it's this nested JSON, as you can see, there's like a bunch of curly brackets and like you have to get things in the right place and the brackets have to match up. So that is, takes a bit of practice and just playing around with. So I would say if you are interested, I would highly recommend just installing Jet Sorry that this is another plug, but I would recommend just installing Jetpack and turning related posts and JSON API on. And you can just start sending queries to the JSON related post API and getting yourself familiarized with how these queries look, right? Um, once you're familiar with that, everything that you have here, that filter parameter, basically you can paste that into Elasticsearch and it will run exactly as is. So once you're familiar with this and you want to keep going with it, maybe try installing Elasticsearch or getting a hosted one and then playing around with it. But there's, you can basically go as deep or as shallow as you want with it, right? Like you can go super deep into the weeds and like push patches to core <coughs> Elasticsearch in Java. Or you can just make curl commands and use JavaScript and Ajax to see what results you get back. Uh, all right, any other questions? Cool, thanks.